Welcome back to You're Not Crazy. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you for for joining us. We're going to be thinking a lot in this episode about the quarrelsome spirit and how to avoid that in our in our Christian lives and leadership. And uh, we're going to be highlighting a, a book by an author I'm sure many of our listeners will know well. He is a very prolific author, which is a great thing because what he writes is is fantastic. But uh, Crossway have published uh, Lead, 12 Gospel Principles for Leadership in the Church by Paul David Tripp. It's a really significant book, so we'll talk about that at the end of the episode. Welcome back to You're Not Crazy, Gospel Sanity for Young Pastors. I'm Ray Orland. I'm with my friend Sam Albury. By the way, guys, um, every book Sam has written, every opportunity you have to hear him preach and teach, <laughs> take my advice and take full advantage of Sam's ministry. Uh, Sam is an apologist for the gospel in this generation and a wise pastor for this generation, and he has a lot to offer you. So, Sam, thanks for being a part of this podcast. Thanks, Ray. You read that word for word what I gave you. That was, that was <laughs> you are, perfect. Oh, gosh. <laughs> You're wonderful and you're ridiculous. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, a bit more lengthy than we've sort of thought our way through before. But, uh, <laughs> Sam, this is actually hard for me to talk about this passage in Second Timothy, precisely because it is so relevant mm-hmm. to our generation today. And um, I don't know what else we can do, but just put right out on the table our responses, our observations, our takeaways from this this very pastoral, wise, fatherly voice warning us away from one ministry style and guiding us toward another ministry MO. Yeah. So let's just jump in. What stands out to you about our passage here for young pastors? Yeah, it is It is so practical. Paul is living in exactly the same reality that we are. But mm-hmm. we just haven't apparently changed since the time this was written. Um, so it's evergreen. I mean, it feels like you could have written this, you know, right now with social media and all of its dysfunction. I think the thing that the first struck me was um, in verse 14, we've just had this this sort of sequence of affirmations about Christ and um, this kind of poetic saying, trustworthy saying in verses 11 to, to 13. He says, remind them of these things, which you would expect. Yeah, these are some big doctrinal kind of markers and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. He goes straight into up there with, you know, remind them of these key foundational truths is make sure people don't quarrel about words. Um, so it's interesting that that he anticipates that being such a ready kind of trap we will fall into. Mm. Um, we, we need to assume that quarrelsome spirit is much closer to us than we think it is. Yes. We might. There's always someone else who's more quarrelsome that you can point to and say, well, I'm not like that person. But Paul is putting this in such a way that I think means we have to assume we are far more prone to this. This is closer to home than we might realize it is. Mm. Uh, last week I read uh, the homily in, in the first book of homilies, Against Contention and Brawling. Tell us what the book of homilies, where um, that's found. Well, in the, as the Reformation was unfolding in England... Uh, the, the tragedy was that the pastors in the churches were so underdeveloped, underinvested in, they were not able to preach. Mm. So the, the leaders of the Reformation actually wrote out sermons that the pastors could read in their churches so that the people would be served and instructed, built up and fed. And so those are the, the, the homilies. And, and here was a matter of such urgency In the eyes of the English reformers, they said, we have to help everybody to get, for this movement of reformation to stay healthy, Hmm. we've got to warn ourselves against a spirit of contention and a spirit of brawling. I'm really struck. I'm solemnized by this passage. Hmm. Uh, Many passages in scripture in in 2 Timothy are so uplifting and so forth. This is sobering. Hmm. He says, uh, for example, in verse 16, avoid 
irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Their talk will spread like gangrene. I noticed in Jerome's Latin translation, he calls it cancer. This is the opposite of the sound words, the healthy words of the gospel. There is, as as you've uh, said already, Sam, just sort of um, uh, like a wildfire uh, across our social landscape right now, uh, fed by social media, a kind of bloodlust for argumentation, yeah, disagreement, winning arguments, proving you're wrong, so I'm proving I'm right. Yeah. Exposing bad people, punishing, stigmatizing, bad thinking, and so forth. Uh, that is, we are the people who need Paul's solemn fatherly warning here. So the, the two things that stand out here in 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 16 are on the one hand, the folly of a contentious spirit, but then the positive alternative, on the other hand, the wisdom of a gentle spirit. And I'm so struck by that, Sam. It is possible for us. This frightens me. It's possible for me to preach the gospel, the true gospel, with such a a wrong spirit Hmm. that I actually end up unsaying what I'm saying without realizing it. Yeah, I'm I'm very struck by, well, A, Paul has already told us to follow the pattern of sound words that he has given to Timothy. Words are that powerful, and Mm. therefore we can expect the wrong kind of words to be equally powerful in the other direction. And so much of of the warnings in this this section are about ill-chosen words, um, irreverent babble, controversies, quarrelsomeness. He's assuming a lot of the the mistakes we'll make here are verbal mistakes. which shouldn't surprise us. Words are designed to have powerful effects. Um, so that 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 is, I think, noteworthy. The other thing that that strikes me is we we have such an established category of in our minds of how you abandon the faith by false doctrine. Paul is showing us you can abandon the faith by being quarrelsome. Mm. You can abandon the faith in your behaviour even while you're still signing the, the doctrinal you know, confession of faith and you know, affirming sound theology, if you're exhibiting the kind of spirit here, you, you can be abandoning the faith just by your conduct. And you and I in this podcast are not saying that abandoning the faith is not a problem. What we're saying is it's actually a bigger problem than perhaps we have taken into account. Yeah, I wrote in my margin here, I just don't see, in my circles, adequately serious consideration of the warnings here in our passage. We are not alarmed by these dangers, the danger of contention and fighting and so forth. Um, A a disputing spirit. We are not alarmed by these dangers as Paul was. We are alarmed only by defections from the truth, not realizing that a contentious spirit is a defection from the truth. Yes. I've, you know, we, we've all seen examples of pastors being fired for sexual sin or for being bullies or for denying the truth. We haven't seen, I've never, maybe it's, it's happened, I've never heard of it, I've not seen a pastor being fired for being quarrelsome online. Wow. But they that should be a criteria that is disqualifying. Um, And I'm not saying that from a position of, this is something I would never have any problem with at all. I've, I've posted things I've regretted. I've, I've asked uh, two of our elders at Emmanuel to keep a close look on my social media and to, to let me know if there's ever anything they think is awry. Um, Mm, This is, you know, this is something any of us is, is very capable of. Um, That's why it's in the Bible. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but it's that it's that important. It's yes. not well. He's a great preacher, and yeah, he can be a bit a bit much on social media. Now, if someone is being quarrelsome and disputatious, that is a very serious sign that they're not a spiritually healthy person in in a position of ministry. Wow. Well, Paul characterizes 
this folly as a youthful passion in verse mm. 22. Flee youthful passions, or uh, earlier translations used to say, flee youthful lusts. And yeah. I, I grew up assuming that he's talking about sexuality, yeah. but it's not. He's The youthful passion he's referring to here is the childish, sophomoric lust for debate. Yes. And if, if one kind of stereotype we have is the, the grumpy old man, the stereotype we're less aware of is the is the the bolshy sparring, cage fighting young man. That that zeal and energy is so often easily kind of mischanneled. You know, when I sort of discovered Reformed theology in the decades ago and just I believe, Sam, Reformed theology just as ideas are incredibly exciting. Yeah. They're exciting ideas, big ideas, comprehensive. It's a paradigm shift. It's a whole worldview. And my young mind coming alive to ideas themselves, I was captivated by Reformed theology. And I think more often than I ever realized, I was dishonoring that very theology, the heart of which is the grace of God. I was the the gracious and merciful initiative of God toward the undeserving. I was dishonoring that very theology and annoying other people, perhaps even harming them, hmm. by advancing that theology with youthful passions. Yeah, a total lack of self awareness. Now that's one of the regrets I have in life, hmm. and so Paul is speaking to all of us here and Pastor. Young pastor, wherever you are on that discovery of the truth of Scripture and wherever you are in your own um, growth and maturation and so forth, I'm sure you can agree with Sam, with me, that the Apostle Paul is not wasting his breath as he warns us against a spirit of contention. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, um, Paul says, but, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. There is a fellowship of sacred pursuits, a fellowship that takes theology seriously, loves theology, relishes theology, loves to open up the Bible and, mm. and share insights and so forth, loves to read uh, significant books and, and loves the truth of God, and simultaneously, be precisely because of the reverence with which we regard the gospel, we preach and teach that and write about it and tweet about it and post about it with the very beauty that is in that gospel yeah. itself. I'm struck in the midst of this discussion, Paul says in verse 16, um, sorry, verse 15, you know, present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Yeah. Uh, we, we are very conscious there is such a thing as wrongly handling the word of truth. It matters how we handle scripture. It's, it's very, very consequential. But rightly handling the word of truth should be the very thing that leads us away from, from being contentious and frivolous in the things that we say because the very act of rightly handling the Bible is is that it does sober us, as you that word you used earlier, it solemnizes us. Um, the last people who should be quarrelsome and, and fractious and divisive are people who are rightly handling the word of truth. That's right. But in our sinfulness, we can turn rightly handling the word of truth into a badge of honor and a form of superiority and become quarrelsome against everyone else who's not handling it quite as rightly as we are. Well, it's a way of building a platform. It is, and you know, I think this has been a weakness in in the, the broader Christian movement I've I've come out of. We we were so blessed by preachers like Dick Lucas who helped us realise God's word does need to be rightly handled. Um, but I think sometimes it led to a pride where we thought we are the ones who've got the Bible right, and it gave us less charity and grace towards others. Um, whereas really rightly handling the word of truth means that we're being humbled by it. I'm really struck by that verse too, Sam. Do your best to present yourself to God. Yeah. 
do your best so there's an eagerness, uh, an active moving toward God. I wrote over here in my margin, truly orthodox, accurate preaching and teaching begins with my own self-presentation to God. Mm. It doesn't begin with study. Mm. It doesn't begin with winning an audience, not with gaining a following and impressive invitations, but with my own reverence, humility, and worship. Mm. I'm really struck by this language. Do your best to present yourself to God. Am I the kind of man, the kind of pastor, preacher, and teacher that can be trusted with the blessing of God? Hmm. Or would I end up corrupting the blessing of God? That requires restraint, self-awareness, humility, and gentleness. Yeah. That, that verse, as, as I read it, one of the, the ways it, it rebukes me is present yourself to God as one approved. I think I'm I'm still seeking the, the approval of so many other people. Mm. You know, I'm presenting myself to all kinds of mental audiences in order to be approved by them. Oh my, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like people thinking ill of me. I don't like the idea that there are people out there who think I'm unsound or, you know, yeah. and it's easy to want to... to to have everyone else's approval but Paul knew that even though everyone else had had turned away from him if you have the Lord's approval you can live with everyone else's disapproval if it yes. comes yeah we don't want that but when we have to choose as inevitably at times we do yeah we choose God which reminds me of something you said before and you you talk about it in the the book we have coming out um Paul's approach to pleasing others. Just share that that insight you've you've written about. Well, I'm so struck that in First Corinthians uh, ten, Paul says, "I try to please everyone in everything I do." Hmm. <laughs> what? That's amazing. The man was a teddy bear when it came to relationships with people. Hmm. He 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 looked out at the human race, and his whole point is he's now looking at the nations. Yeah, And everywhere he goes in the mission field, from one end of the Roman Empire to the other, in different human situations, different cultures, different expectations, he tried to be sensitive and to adapt mm. so that he would not create an unnecessary impediment uh, to uh, the advance of the gospel. But then in Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, um, you know, he comes out with these strong statements. If you don't preach the gospel accurately, anathema. Mm. And he says, am I now trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not please the Lord. So, when Paul had a choice between pleasing others and pleasing himself, he chose to please others. When he had a choice between, was faced with a choice between pleasing others and pleasing Christ, mm -hmm. he chose Christ. But himself, he always put last. Yeah, that is so profound. You know, and I'm struck too... Um, by verses 20 and 21 here in 2 Timothy 2, Sam, because these are two of the most important verses in the Bible for me personally. Mm. They're never far from my mind. He says, now, in a great house. So he paints the picture of a palatial mansion up on a hill outside town, and that's the Christian church. So a lot of people live there. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. So off the kitchen in this great big lovely house, there's a pantry, shelves lining the walls, and there are silver serving dishes, maybe even some gold plate and so forth, and there are wooden bowls and clay pots and everything for different you know, mm -hmm. occasions. Therefore, he says, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, now, what I love about that, Sam, is all he's asking me to let go of is what I don't want anyway. Mm. What is dishonorable? What is low? What is of the nature of compromise, self-indulgence, and so forth? And by the way, I'm looking at the words, cleanses himself. If my theology is so reformed that I can't let the Bible tell me to cleanse myself by God's grace, that I need to agree with the Bible against my theology. Yeah. 
Mm. But I'm grateful for the word anyone, if anyone, mm. however messy it might be. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Like a ready for every good work, like one of these multi-tools. Yeah. That has all kinds of, you know, jackknife blades and screwdrivers and you know, I mean you you're omnicompetent, ready for every good work. Yeah. That doesn't mean the Lord is going to use you in every way, but you're ready. Yeah. So here's the master of the house, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, walks into the kitchen. There's a special occasion coming. He wants to get ready for it. There's the pantry. He walks in the pantry and he says, I need something special. Let's see. Uh, he's looking around, you know, at the different mm -hmm. uh, uh, utensils there. And he says, oh, there, that, that one is just right for this occasion. He reaches out, takes it off the shelf and go uses it. Mm -hmm. I want to be ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when the Lord walks in yeah. and he says, I've got something I want to accomplish. I need a vessel fit for noble use. Sam, I want to be ready. And I'm really, that's so helpful, Ray, because it, it reminds me that what makes us ready isn't our ministerial prowess and our, yeah. you know, what other people think of us. It's cleansing ourselves from what is dishonorable. Yes. If we're, if we're giving ourselves to that, we will be so usable by the Lord. Mm. So much of, I'm seeing already this theme in, in 2 Timothy, at the very point where we're often tempted to trust, trust in fleshly capacities, we're being brought back to basic Christian character. Mm. Wow. The spirit of, of power and love and self-control, rather than, you know, you can steamroll anyone into oh my. anything, whatever it might be. Um, Sam, that is so important. Basic Christian, obvious basics. Sam, if we want to be ready for tomorrow, whatever God has in store, that's where we need to go and stay. Yeah. Which is, again, verse 22. So flee youthful passions, and you've, you've already helped us to see what those are, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I, those are, there's things that we, we turn away from, and there are things that we turn to. There are things that we mortify, and there are things that we aspire towards um pursue righteousness faith love peace we tend to pursue platforms recognition mm. importance comfort money but actually we're to pursue righteousness faith love and peace and i love that he he adds along with those who call on the lord from a pure heart there's a sort of sense of you're not the only one around here you know there's there's others around there too. That's a great point. Um, you're part of a, of a, there's a, yeah. Verse 24 is a prophetic word to our generation. The Lord's servant, and immediately we think of Isaiah and mm. the prophecies of Jesus himself. The Lord's servant must not, must, M-U-S-T, must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Hmm. Francis Schaeffer used to say, if I have a one-hour conversation with a liberal theologian, I want him, it's a significant conversation, I want him to leave with two equally clear impressions. One, Francis Schaeffer disagrees with him. Two, Francis Schaeffer cares about him. Mm. Gosh, that's good. Yeah, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, not patiently paying evil back, yeah. but absorbing it, correcting his opponents with gentleness, not body slamming them, yeah. with the perfect put down, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. So it seems, Paul seems to be connecting our deportment toward very trying people who are truly wrong our deportment toward them, our attitude toward them, the way we treat them. Do we dignify them or shame them? Mm. Do we push them away or pull them in? And he connects that with their opportunity to repent. Yeah. I'm, I'm so, this is so <laughs> countercultural for us because culturally we live in a time where you agree with someone 
and are there, thereby their friend, or you disagree with them and thereby you reject them. What we don't have a category for in the world today, and, and sadly often in the church, is disagreeing with someone in a way that's kind and friendly. Yes. Which is what Paul's talking about here. We're not to there's there's one part of us that doesn't want to correct anyone for anything because that feels yes. just too much conflict, too much confrontation. Or there's people who love to correct people without gentleness. So I think it, it's so telling that Paul tells we do have to do correcting at times, but with gentleness because actually there's a positive intent we are longing for in that correction, um, that God might perhaps grant repentance. And I don't know where I got this from. I doubt I had the, the wits to make this up. So I'm, I'll assume I heard this somewhere else, but it's it stayed with me and helped me in, in some very conflicty situations but the the idea is always make it easy for someone to do the right thing oh that's really good so if someone does need to to be corrected or or to repent let's bring that to them in a way that makes it as easy as possible for them to do the right thing rather than adding additional barriers because now not only do they need to repent of the lord but you know it's going to be a pride swallowing ordeal to have to come back to us after what we've said to them you know i've seen you do that sam i've seen you demonstrate that wisdom and oh gosh i hope so it's very actually it's very impressive very surprising i have this uh, wonderful brief uh, quote from francis schaeffer's book the mark of the christian hmm. and he said we should never come to differences with true christians without regret and without tears sounds simple doesn't it Believe me, evangelicals have not often shown it. We rush in being very pleased, it would seem, to find other men's mistakes. We build ourselves up by tearing others down. This can never show a real oneness among Christians. There is only one kind of man, one kind of pastor, who can fight the Lord's battles in anywhere near a proper way, and that is the pastor who, by nature, is unbelligerent. Hmm. The pastor who finds conflict distasteful not unthinkable but is very careful a belligerent man tends to enter into conflict because he is belligerent at least it looks that way the world must observe that when we must differ with each other we do it not because we love the smell of blood the smell of the arena the smell of the bullfight but because we must for the lord's sake if there are tears when we must speak, then something beautiful can be observed. Hmm. I think, Sam, our, our only real path into the future is marked by beauty, yeah. not by winning. Um, Stott, in his commentary, says, We would be wise to ask ourselves regarding every kind of teaching both what its attitude is toward God and what its effect and what effect it has on people. There is invariably something about error which is dishonoring to God and damaging to people. Hmm. The truth, on the other hand, always honors God, promotes godliness, and always edifies its hearers. It builds them up in faith, love, and holiness. That's the ministry Second Timothy is calling us to hmm. and is Simultaneously, I'm so struck by this, Sam, warning us against many ministry strategies that might appear to work mm. short term. Yeah. But calling us back, as you said, to the basics of character, the basics of orthodoxy, and relationships and communication of gentleness. Mm. As you said, making it as easy as possible for the person who's in the wrong to come around and join hands with us again. Wow. Yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to wrap things up. but oh, uh, All right. So much the better. Well, I was just going to say, we're, um, you know, with all of this in mind, we, we, you know, we, when we mention our friends at Crossway, we're not simply paying the bills and, you know, checking boxes. We, we genuinely, with all of our heart, revere the work Crossway does. They are such a blessing to us. Um, we wanted to... to to mention and to commend um, Paul Tripp's book, Lead. Um, 
you've come up, you, you must have known Paul for a while. How, how, how would you describe Paul's he, ministry? Yes. Paul is a sage. He is um, a profound and wise man who knows the Lord with such insight that he knows where the landmines are, hmm. and he also knows where the green pastures and the still waters are. Hmm. And he can lead us away from the landmines and into the green pastures and beside the still waters. Paul is, uh, I have never listened to Paul or read anything by Paul that didn't help me significantly. Yeah, He's, a, he's a, an amazing resource. Crossway's publish, publication of his book, Lead, is, is uh, ideal for an elder team. Yeah. To read through together. And it ties in so much with the passage we've just been looking at. The, the subtitle of the book is, it's called Lead 12 Gospel Principles for Leadership in the Church. And Paul is um, so good at identifying those subtle fleshly ways that we try and further God's God's kingdom and, and, and the gospel cause. So we, we would commend that book to you, we would commend Paul to you. He he also, I think, has the best facial hair in, in <laughs> the Christian world today. Yes. But, and um, historically epic mustache. Yes. <laughs> that that thing will be unchanged in the new creation. It needs no <laughs> no further improvement. Um thanks as always, folks, for, for listening. It is such a, a privilege to have this time with you. We're grateful to uh, not only to Crossway for sponsoring this, but to TGC for hosting this podcast and for um for all that they're doing for us as well. Thank you. <laughs>